explaining everything you need to know about Maharaga and Megami and questions like, can Megami still summon Maharaga even though it was killed by Sukuna? How does the adaptation ability work? I've gotten so many questions about different facets of this. I'm gonna try to combine it all into one informative video. So let's get into it. So to begin, we're gonna kind of lay the groundwork by describing how Maharaga and this technique works. And then we can kind of answer the questions from there. Also, this is gonna be an anime friendly video. So there will be no manga information here. Okay, so Maharaga is the crown jewel of the Ten Shadows technique, which is a technique that uses Shikigami. However, in order to use the Shikigami, the Ten Shadows user must first defeat the Shikigami in one-on-one -on -one combat through a ritual summoning ceremony. Maharaga is so strong that no Ten Shadows user in the history of the Zenin clan has been able to successfully do this. He just eats them for lunch. However, just because Maharaga has never been tamed does not mean it still can't serve its use to the Ten Shadows user, as we've seen Megami do, and we also know that a previous Ten Shadows user did against a previous Limitless Six Eyes user, like Gojo, you can summon Maharaga for the ritual ceremony and bring somebody else into that summoning with you. Now, like I said, you have to beat Maharaga by yourself to be able to command him. So why would you bring anybody in the ritual with you? Well, two reasons. First, it's the Kamikaze special. Just like we were talking about with Megami and the previous Ten Shadows user, if you know you're gonna go out regardless, you might as well summon Maharaga, cause yeah, Maharaga's gonna take you down, but then he'll also take down whoever you drug into the ritual ceremony, unless that person is somehow strong enough to defeat Maharaga, like we saw with Sukuna. The second reason would be bring friends along for your protection. Now, in Megami's case, he's from a long line of Zen and Clan members that have gotten the Ten Shadows technique. However, think back to the first first ever Ten Shadows user. They didn't know that Maharaga was the final Shikigami. They didn't know what they were getting into. So it would probably be wise to get like, you know, several of your friends to be like, hey, I'm gonna summon this last one. In case it's crazy, I'll have all of you here to help me defeat it. And then, you know, I can have a better idea of if I'm capable of taking it on by myself or not. Now that we've laid that groundwork, we can start to answer some of these questions. First of all, can Megami still summon Maharaga even though Sukuna killed it? Yes, he can, because again, he didn't defeat it by himself, so he can't control Maharaga yet, but neither is Maharaga permanently gone because Sukuna killed it. It just kind of ended that summoning ritual in a null and void ending. So Megami can still summon it again. He could use it in another Kamikaze ritual, or he could try to do it one-on-one -on -one to take it out himself. Another frequent question I got was, why doesn't Gojo help Megami tame Maharaga? Well, now you know the answer to that, because Megami has to do it alone. Now let's talk about why Maharaga is such a beast. Why has no one in the Zenin clan been able to tame this thing? Well, it's because of its ability, adaptation. This thing behind Maharaga's head is known as the Dharma Chakra Wheel. And as Maharaga is fighting, it will turn and click, representing Maharaga, adapting to whatever is being thrown at him. Now, adapting is pretty ambiguous. What does that actually mean? Well, it, it is ambiguous, and that's kind of why it's so strong. He can literally adapt to anything. Just like we saw in the battle with Sukuna, Sukuna was using his slashing attacks on Maharaga, which initially did some damage, but then Maharaga started adapting to them, and then he could see Sukuna's slashes, and that's ultimately why he survived Sukuna's domain expansion, because at that point, he had experienced enough of the slashes to make it so that he wouldn't perish in that moment. Now, Maharaga's adaptation process isn't immediate, which is why it is possible to defeat him. You basically just need to use an attack and end him in one strike with something he's not familiar with, which is why Sukuna used the flame arrow. A simple analogy to think about this would be to imagine rock, paper, scissors. If you and I are playing rock, paper, scissors, and I throw scissors on our first attempt, you're going to think that was just random, right? But if I throw scissors on the next 10 attempts in a row, you're going to start to adapt to my strategy and think, he throws scissors a lot. Now, I'm not supremely confident that I should throw rock every time, but I probably have a pretty high chance of success with rock. Now, imagine I throw scissors for the next 10 thousand times. At that point, you're going to be pretty adapted to me and you're going to know you can just throw rock every time to beat me. That's kind of what Maharaga does. So the first time you throw something at him, he'll start to adapt, but he won't be fully adapted at it. 
But the more you throw the same thing at him, he will adapt to it more and more to the point where he's going to become completely immune to it. I think that covers the most frequently asked questions I've gotten about Maharaga, but if there's anything I missed or you need clarification, just let me know in the comments. Uh, but to briefly recap it all up, Megami can still summon Maharaga. He's not permanently gone from Sukuna having defeated him, but Megami also does not command Maharaga. He has to beat him by himself. 